on 19 keys and this is high level conversation and and that says a lot about society and why we create technology because that same technology can use to prevent Right. And not just predict, but those markers of prediction, they're not. It's like the FBI don't watch you to try to predict, pre prevent a crime. Right. They're going to let you fall into the trap to where they got enough on you to where they can lock you up. Right. And the company is basically taking that same model and that same mind frame and saying, yeah, we'll go predict it. The cops ain't going to try to intervene. Right. They're not going to figure out. All right. Well, if you got the technology that can predict, what about the technology that can help prevent? Can you then create an algorithm where this person, uh, you take their graph and their profile and you can then manipulate them to be a better citizen? Right. No, nah, because now you stop building prisons. Now you messing up with somebody else's business. Now that business go come after you like, wait a minute. How you go create a business that stops mine? Right. I think that that's really speaks upon. That's why we talked about clean technology. And it's like man is not ready for the knowledge he has. Right. And we've, you know, my whole life, I, I love technology. I love science. Right. I love progress. But I've been recently thinking about, you know, a lot of times progress is the enemy of peace. Right. Because peace is equanimity is peace is solace with things the way that they are. Right. Content with the way that they are. Right. We we are free. We good. I like where we at. And then somebody comes. Nope. I want to build something that's going to change everything. But when you change everything and all these ripple effects happen, it disturbs the peace. So that's why I said at the beginning, technology is a harbor of chaos, you know, in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we need that interruption, right? That interruption that says that, wait a minute, I don't like the way things are. I'm going to create something that change things for the better. But in that period, I have to create some chaos before we can get to order. Right. And that's the whole balancement that it is trying to get to. But that is not where we at today as a society. You have some people that are on the light and the dark side spectrum, if you will. And then you have some people that's creating it unwittingly, knowing that they're working for that side because they're not drawing out their attentions to the root to say, OK, I want this capital. I'm not really thinking about the ripple effects of how it be used. And that's how we get the turn. We have this blind justice. You know what I'm saying? Because we should have more things and more technology that is created for preventative measures, not predictive measures, right? If you have that power, harness it for a way to change society for the better to where say, yeah, they built prisons based on, you know, it's a third grade reports. Now, of course, that's an obsolete way of looking at it, right? They can look at before you was born and your parents coming together and say, oh, they had a certain amount of children, a bunch of them going to end up in prison. So, boom, based on these people coming together and they graphs and they profiles. Yeah. Make sure in 2020 and 33, you feel me? We build at least 12 in this particular area because we already predicted where this path leads. So I believe it's, it's on us on the opposite side. It's not the fear of technology because those that we fear having it, it's not going to stop building it. Right. It's the other side to where you have to empower yourself with the knowledge to say, OK, how about we create some of this preventative technology to where we get to change things and create more order from the chaos? But I want to go back on to, as you was talking about social media, I want to go on what are some of the ways that people in your estimated um, judgment, pain, or observation can protect themselves during this age? Well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> One with an answer that is not as easy as opting out, mm -hmm. right? I think that's where we, we tend to go first is, well, if we don't like it, just don't participate. The reality is that that's not how our social environments have been constructed. Um, so in lieu of opting out, the biggest thing that we can do collectively, especially in this moment, is come together and be intentional about shaping how it gets used. Mm. So you mentioned that a lot of these technologies are being built with like destruction in mind and destruction in purpose and to further the goals of the institutions offline and how they've been operating for hundreds of years, just doing it online and automated. And there's not a lot being built on our behalf. Well, there's, in my opinion, two reasons for that. One is that right now we're living in the imagination of this old white dude mm. who back in the 40s and 50s wrote a series of short stories. And this is back before a computer is even small enough to fit inside of a, a building. 
And these stories he wrote were about a time in the future where humans had built these human-like robots that were so, you know, so like almost as smart as them. And they end up starting to fight and they create the great robot wars. And these short stories are called I, Robot. Mm. So Isaac Asimov imagined this, put it out into the collective to imagine. And then now, what are we trying to build? Human-like robots. So we're still living in his imagination. Yeah. And so my question is, where is our collective imagination? Mm -hmm. It's locked up in survival. It's locked up in avoiding these things. So the first thing we can do to protect ourselves is become aware of what these technologies are and what the possibilities are that we can do with them. So if you've always wanted to make art, but your mama couldn't afford art classes like mine, learn how to use these generative tools to tell your story, to tell the stories that you want to tell, to be able to go in and use these tools if you've ever wanted to write a script and you don't know how to put it in professional language. That's where these tools can help you and, and yourself become aware and, and shape your knowledge and have your story be become a part of the collective imagination. I think the other piece is right now we're in the wild, wild west of artificial intelligence. Companies do not have any rules about how they build and test these systems. So I could be building an AI for a cancer machine to determine how much, you know, chemo I should drip inside of you. And I wouldn't have to tell you I was using AI to do it. I wouldn't have to test it. I wouldn't have to make sure it works well for different people from different backgrounds, ages, body sizes. And then if I mess up, I could just say, oops, well, that was my algorithm. Mm. It was the AI that made the mistake. It wasn't me. And we see that in a number of places right now that most people aren't aware of. You hear about like people using a generative AI to like make porn or like you might hear like, oh, Google's image search results are biased, mm -hmm. that, that type of thing. But like they're using AI in child protective services. Mm. So Illinois had done this study, I think, 2013 to 2014 with this tool. I basically took in your case report. So you call in CPS, you know, all oh, this child's in danger. It takes it in. And then on a scale of like zero to 100, how likely is this child to die? So like zero, they're not really at risk of being hurt. 100 is like they're absolutely going to die. So they, the state of Illinois did a study for a year with this technology, and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Like it said over 360 children were 100% going to die that weren't in danger. There were children that died that weren't, weren't flagged by the system. And even when you got up to like 70, 80%, which is like they're seriously at risk of being harmed, the kids weren't actually in danger, and they were all black and brown, the ones it was flagging. So Illinois was like, yo, we're not using this tool. It doesn't work. They canceled the contract. Mm -hmm. But 14 states in the U.S. still use that because there's no rules. Mm. And we're not showing up to board meetings. We're not showing up to city council meetings right. where they're deciding to adopt this technology. We're not getting on some old government website that looks like eBay in 1994 trying to look at the contracts they got bids out for to see what they're doing. And so right now, laws are being made around this. And while I know that the policy lever has not always worked in our community's favor, we have a very unique opportunity right now to shape the way that those laws are formed. People listen when we get mad on social media about mm -hmm. things. When the whole Internet went crazy about the Taylor Swift AI porn thing, look what happened. They introduced two bills mm -hmm. within a matter of days. AI porn has been an issue for a really long time. People are downloading that software and making like children mm. and then they say oh we can't we can't get them in trouble because it's not a real kid mm. this has been something people in my circle have been trying to fight for but can't get that mass push so we have to understand the power of our collective voice and say i don't want you using ai and policing mm. i don't want you using facial recognition without my permission at the airport i don't want you using ai to try to predict if i'm going to commit a crime not only do they do that in the New York Police Department, they've been doing it in court systems, too. They call it pretrial sentencing. Mm. So when you commit a crime, they go in, they have this questionnaire thing that they have you fill out that makes no sense. Like, I looked at the questions underneath it. The questions are like, did you grow up with both parents? Have you ever thought about committing a crime? Like, what does that have to do? Like, what? How, who, how many best friends do you have? Like, the mm. questions on there are just, just the weirdest stuff. But they were using that to say this person is likely to commit a crime and then it would spit out a recommended sentence. Mm. And it was biased. It's been biased. Most major court systems in the U.S. use it today. They got this other technology called predictive policing. They call it PredPol. It's interesting, like predators polling, mm. right? But predictive policing. And it takes historical crime data. So how much crime has happened and where? 
and is supposed to predict where crime is going to happen next to tell the cops where they should spend their time. Mm. So now the cops can say, we're not biased right. against your community. The, the, the data told us to go mm-hmm. there because y'all had already policed our communities. It, there was a report that just came out that it don't work like 99% of the time, but that don't stop right. LAPD, Chicago PD, SFPD, NYPD from using it. And so I think in this moment in time to protect ourselves, the biggest thing that we have to do is one, become aware of these technologies and the fact that this kind of stuff is happening so that we can collectively use our voice to shape rules around how it can and can't be used. Because we have more power now than we think to shape these systems. These companies are scared of our generations. Mm-hmm. They're scared of being held accountable, what they call canceled. They're, they're scared of being held accountable. They know it affects their money. Look at how we hurting Kellogg right now. Mm. Look at how we hurting Starbucks and McDonald's right now. We have collective power in a way that maybe economically we haven't had in past generations. So it's on us to make sure that we're shaping the rules and shaping the imagination about what's possible and not being subject to responding to what someone else's imagination shapes. And we owe that to these next generations coming up. Information is everywhere. You can log into YouTube right now and type in almost any subject. But I'm gonna be honest with you, you won't even know if it's human generated or if it's just based on the algorithm that figured out that you wanted to find this subject and queried your information, created an automated process so they can get your eyeballs to try to sell you a product or get advertisement dollars. Humans need humans. We don't work and operate that well learning from machines because it's the connection to the information, it's the connection to the process that allows us to grow our neurons. It's that connection that allows us to be able to tap into that tapestry of thought to where we need to learn and be in environments to where we feel aspirational and we are inspired and it's empathetic. So today it's not about just having access to the information. It's not just about being able to have democratized education everywhere. It's about connection. Are you actually connected to it? When you are in a community, it reinforces that environment of connection. And that's why being a part of high level is so important. So you are reinforcing an environment with that human connection. I see you, you see me, you feel felt, you want to learn. Information and data, statistics and numbers and automation is fine, especially if you want to create income and utilize the technology for such. The human connection has always been a real source of learning. Don't just go for the information. Go for the community and go for the connection. Tap in with the guy. I'm 19 Keys and this is high level conversation.